Tonight, Prime Minister stands firm on Vossarong's appointment. FWCC unhappy with Linda Tambuya's removal. And pitch demur harvesting will cease from December. Bulavanaka and leading our bulletin tonight. Why look outside Parliament when we have qualified people inside? These were the words of Prime Minister Sitiveni Rambuka, reaffirming his decision to stick with the appointment of Philemon Bosorongo as Attorney General. Speaking from Australia, Rambuka noted the concerns of the Fiji Law Society, but stands his ground. Stella Morosio Tawoi has the details. Prime Minister Sitiveni Rambuka has responded to Fiji Law Society's objection on the appointment of Philemon Bosorongo as the Attorney General. He remains adamant on his decision despite the society's threats to pursue this matter in court if forced to do so. For the moment, the, um, the Fiji Law Society has uh, given us an opening. They said that if I do not withdraw my appointment, then they would have to go to court. In which case, I will wait for that, to uh, let them go to court. So that, because there are two sides, it's a disputed decision now. When you, whenever you have two sides to a... Uh, to an argument, you take it to court for, uh, for adjudication. And that's a, the proper way to do it. He also confirmed that no consultations were made with the ministers involved. However, this would not affect the collision as the NFP members are still intact, while Sodelpo will still have the ministries they initially asked for. Uh, it just happened. Uh, all my uh, three deputy prime ministers who would have consulted, I would have consulted with, were away from the country at the time. So I had to make it and face the consequences. While his stand remains, there are no plans to look for options outside of parliament. But why look outside parliament when we have qualified people inside? The Fiji Law Society's concerns follows revelation that Vosarongo pleaded guilty in a number of disciplinary cases before the Independent Legal Service Commission. Stella Mauricio Taoi, Fiji One News. Meanwhile, the Fiji Labour Party is appalled that Prime Minister Sitiveni Rambuka continues to stubbornly uphold the appointment of Philemon Wasarongo as Attorney General, despite the fact that it is clearly unconstitutional and is strongly opposed by the Fiji Law Society as such. Labour leader Mahendra Chowdhury says Rambuka's comments, stating that he is willing to push the matter to a judicial review rather than withdraw the appointment, signals his lack of confidence in the op opinion of the Fiji Law Society. Chaudhry stressed the unceremonious manner in which the reshuffle was announced is being strongly questioned by some of his own ministers. He adds what we are seeing is a simply continuation of the questionable and often unconstitutional practices and policies of the former Fiji First government. Chaudhry also questioned the appointment of John Rambuku as acting director of public prosecutions, stating Rambuku was found guilty of professional misconduct in relation to trust funds by the ILSC in 2013. Chandra cautioned there is a degree of arrogance and defiance of the requirements of accountability and transparency coming through which bode ill for the future governance of our nation. In the last 12 months, the Fiji Trade Commission to Australia has assisted with the registration and implementation of over a dozen investment projects in Fiji from Australia valued at more than 25 million Fijian dollars. This was revealed during the Fiji Business and Investor Talanoa Cocktail, which was attended by Prime Minister Siti Rambuka, who is in his official visit to Australia. This investment projects generated more than 300 local jobs in Fiji. Eva Danford with the details. Fiji's Trade Commission to Australia has added close to 10% of value to Fiji's overall merchandise trade with Australia over the past year facilitating over $70 million in exports from Fiji. While addressing the Fijian community in Sydney, Prime Minister Siti Beni Rambuka says that as Fijians living in Australia, they should take pride in their heritage and homeland. He says that the People's Coalition government is committed in removing barriers for the former Fijian citizens particularly when it comes to investment and the ease of doing business. There's around 100,000 people of Fiji origin or Fijians uh, living and enjoying life here in Australia. Let me tell you, 
that life is not too bad in Fiji. And uh, those who might have uh, read the, uh, the paper today will have heard or read what the uh, Minister for Home Affairs and Immigration has just released. So you're all welcome to come back, renew your status in Fiji, and Fiji is prepared to welcome you and your family. Rambuka also acknowledged the immense contribution that the Fijian community has made in Australia and back home in Fiji. We enjoy very much and we respect your contribution to the development of Fiji. So, I hope you will continue, those who come from Fiji, continue to be contributors, contrib uh, positive contributors to this great land. He also highlighted that the new era of cooperation in further strengthening people-to-people -people links and enduring bilateral partnership, which provides a strong foundation for enhancing economic cooperation, defense and security, and developing trade and investment ties. I'm here just to uh, reassure you that that is very true now, as it has, have, as it has always been, perhaps not so noticeable in the last few years. We want you to uh, enjoy the hospitality of this great nation. We're so proud that you have all contributed to the well-being, welfare of this great country. The Prime Minister adds that the Fijian community should also be proud of the immense strides Fiji has made and continues to make as it embarks on a new era of prosperity and cooperation. Eva Danford, Fiji One News. The Fiji Women's Crisis Centre is appalled at the removal of the Minister for Women, Children and Social Protection, Linda Tamboya, from her position as the Leader of Government Business in Parliament. This comes after Prime Minister Siti Veni Rambuka had announced last week that Tamboya has been replaced by the Minister for Public Works, Ro Filipe Tuisawao. Crisis Centre Coordinator Shami Ali says they want the Prime Minister to outline the reasons why Tamboya was removed. Ali says they also want to remind the Prime Minister that that though he is the captain of the ship, meaning Fiji, he does not own the ship. He, she says the government has a sound gender policy, which includes national action plan to prevent violence against women and girls, policies on women's economic empowerment, and a policy to promote women's political leadership. Ali says the lack of women in parliament is always lamented, and yet the prime minister chose to remove an accomplished female MP from an important leadership role. She says they would also like to remind those in parliament that more women than men voted in the last election, despite the now repealed name change law. Ali says Linda Tambo is also the deputy party leader of the People's Alliance, receiving votes second to the Prime Minister, the woman with the highest votes in the 2018 and 2022 elections and in the last election she was fourth in the number of votes overall. The harvesting of beech dimmer or sea cucumber will cease from the 31st of December this year to protect its breeding cycle. Permanent Secretary for Fisheries Atalete Rokosuka says that the beech dimmer industry has directly, directly benefited local maritime communities since its resumption in June this year. Eparamawarua with this report. The harvesting and trade of beech dimmer was put to a complete ban in 2017 after the Ministry of Fisheries saw an extensive depletion. The ban was lifted in June this year by the current government. However, this will be seized in the next two months. This is um, currently in its opening period. Uh, it will uh, be closed in the next um, two to three months, probably in the next two months, two and a half months or so. By 31st December, all harvesting will cease. Uh, all because of the need for us to ensure that we uh, are able to help communities in this period as well as to ensure sustainability for the future eh? in terms of having stocks that are, that are there. Data reveal that maritime communities garnered around $18 million of direct benefits through the beach dimmer trade. And as of now, harvesting, trade and consumption continues. We have companies that are, that are already trading uh, market access is already uh, moving into um, to other to the markets in terms of um, China and other Asian markets that have uh, sea cucumber or BDM as a delicacy. But the ministry, this is a second opening, eh? 
So we've actually taken learnings from the first opening through to the second opening. And should there be another opening, we will take all the learnings as we move on. Eh? But um, it's going to expire or it's going to cease in thir on 31st December of 2023. The trade has become the main source of livelihood for many maritime communities. It was actually lifted as a way of um, alternative livelihood for our people out there in the coastal communities in the rural areas. Uh, we've had um, data that we've received in the past of around 18 million or so that was direct benefits that went to the communities uh, and where they have um, invested, where they've actually built houses, and then other ventures that have actually greatly benefited them. Eh? Uh, and this government saw the need uh, to continue to open that um, because of the, the benefits. The ban will allow the bit dimmer population to recover as well as to save the species from extinction. Eparamawarua, Fiji One News. In the news ahead, improvement on collection of data on human rights is a must. and World Investment Forum Boost Energy Transition Partnerships. Hello again. It is important to, do not, to know what to do before any disaster strikes. These were the sentiments of the Special Representative of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, Mami Mizutori, who is currently in Fiji, to discuss the collaborative efforts between her office and other partnering organizations in the realm of disaster risk reduction. The government of Fiji has brought together other governments in the region, but also many different stakeholders who are all um, engaged in one way or another to disaster risk reduction. This is our mandate and we are here so that together we can raise the awareness of disasters in this region which is unfortunately very much hit by uh, multiple uh, multi-hazard uh, uh, related natural um, occasions, events. Ms. Torres says events like the National Disaster Awareness Week are very important in terms of preparedness. It is, as I mentioned, uh, very much susceptible to um, disasters. And at this time when we are um, going to um, have the next COP uh, in uh, late November and December, we would like to work with the government, understand how we can support the government so that uh, the government can uh, be more um, accessible to uh, climate financing, disaster risk reduction financing, so that we can build the resilience of Fiji together. The National Disaster Management Office today officially launched National Disaster Awareness Week 2023. The event will allow the public to understand the risks they face, know how to respond when disaster strikes, and work together to build a resilient nation. National Disaster Awareness Week is more than just an event on the calendar. It is an embodiment of our commitment to a safer and more secure future. It is time for us to come together to learn, to share and to remember that disaster preparedness is not the responsibility of one, but the duty of all. This week is about awareness, about knowledge, about unity and about action. It is about understanding the risks we face, knowing how to respond when disaster strikes, and working together to build a more resilient nation. It is a time to acknowledge the vital role that each and everyone plays in our community's safety. We must also remember that we are not alone in this endeavor. Our government, civil society, humanitarian partners, and international organizations here today also stand with us in our mission to reduce the risks posed by disasters. Collaboration both nationally and internationally is essential in creating a safer future for Fiji and the region. 
The Human Rights Measurements Initiative, or HRMI, launched its specific data on human rights for the region yesterday in Suva. HRMI is a global collaboration between researchers and on-the-ground defenders to track the human rights performance of countries around the world. Human Rights Ad Advocate Rashika Deo says that there is the need for collection of data on human rights to make better policies. Data is silent on human rights status. It becomes critical for civil society organizations, universities and academia, and data collection agencies like HRMI to collect and share data. Inclusive, comprehensive, and accurate data means better policies and resource allocation, which means transformative changes that address the inequalities and power imbalances. Data can change lives. Disability Pride Hub's Krishnia Sen says there's lack of awareness and education on human rights. Sen adds that there's a need for data and findings be available readily to the public so that the disability community is no longer looked down on or discriminated against. Very little to no knowledge about it. You know, having one's dignity, integrity, justice, the abilities, no, the focus is more on um, um, able-bodied persons, but the education and awareness to persons with disabilities is very little, as well as their capacities to know or access information. Another major challenge is the communication. Um, and that, when there is a lack of communication and information, this leads to um, violence, you know, we are looked uh, Dama, there are Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade Manu Akamikamida has lauded the World Investment Forum as an opportunity to gain and explore new perspectives and lessons to further the impact of just energy transition partnerships. The minister is currently in Abu Dhabi to attend this international forum. In March 2023, Fiji joined Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Tonga, the Solomon Islands in New Way in the Port Vila call for a just transition to a fossil fuel free Pacific through the island nations called for accelerated action to enable the just and equitable phase out of coal, oil and gas. Kamikamida says they have also identified key Pacific tailored development pathways to support the collective move towards renewable energy. He applauds Vietnam, Indonesia and South Africa for the progressing their clean development objectives and ambitions through the development of comprehensive financing and implementation plans. In our resilient community segment tonight, Fiji's commitment to improving transparency efforts in its offshore fisheries sector balances the need for economic development and the need to conserve and protect its marine ecosystems. This was emphasized by the Minister for Fisheries, Kalaveti Ravu, at the opening of a fisheries workshop in Lamy this morning. In 2021, Fiji's fisheries sector contributed around $149.8 million to national income, requiring more efforts to ensure the long-term management of our fisheries resources at Paramuarua with this report. The Ministry of Fisheries is working with stakeholders to manage, protect and sustain our marine ecosystem, culminating in a regional workshop on improving fisheries transparency. Minister for Fisheries Kalaveti Ravu says they have a crucial responsibility to safeguard and manage marine resources for the benefit of our people. Fiji, like many nations across the Pacific, faces unique challenges in the management of offshore fisheries. Balancing the urgent needs of, for economic development with the imperative to conserve the, and protect our marine ecosystem is a formidable task. It is a challenge that requires innovation, collaboration and most importantly, transparency. The two days workshop will identify the challenges and work collectively to seek solutions. This will also help in advancing the Pacific's agenda. Improving transparency of fisheries management and improving good fisheries governance is recognized as a critical and important and effective tool to address the IUU area that is really 
creating increasing challenges here in the Pacific and across the globe. And it's something that we need to get a handle on. There is a report that was put out in 2021 by the, the Pacific Island Fisheries Forum Agency in MRAG Asia that estimated the value of tuna harvested and transshipped in the Pacific tuna fisheries involving IUU, which equated to approximately 333 billion US dollars. Fiji leads the Pacific with a sustainable and well-managed offshore fisheries sector, and the participants is expected to learn and enhance their knowledge in this area. We recognize that transparency is not merely a buzzword in intentional agreement. It is a responsibility to our people, to our fellow nations in the Pacific, and to the global communities as we collectively work towards a common goal in com combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in our EEZ and in the high seas. The Improving Fisheries Transparency in Fiji workshop convened by the Ministry of Fisheries with support from the Pacific Office of the World Wild Fund for Nature represents a collaborative effort to create a future where oceans thrive, communities prosper, and the Pacific remains a beacon of resilience and sustainability. Eparamoa Rua, Fiji One News. Fiji One News continues with business after the break. Stay with us. Hello again. It is important to, do not, to know what to do before any disaster strikes. These were the sentiments of the Special Representative of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, Mami Mizutori, who is currently in Fiji, to discuss the collaborative efforts between her office and other partnering organizations in the realm of disaster risk reduction. The government of Fiji has brought together other governments in the region, but also many different stakeholders who are all um, engaged in one way or another to disaster risk reduction. This is our mandate and we are here so that together we can raise the awareness of disasters in this region which is unfortunately very much hit by uh, multiple uh, multi-hazard uh, uh, related natural um, occasions, events. Ms. Otori says events like the National Disaster Awareness Week are very important in terms of preparedness. It is, as I mentioned, uh, very much susceptible to um, disasters. And at this time, when we are um, going to um, have the next COP uh, in uh, late November and December, we would like to work with the government, understand how we can support the government so that uh, the government can uh, be more um, accessible to uh, climate financing, disaster risk reduction financing, so that we can build the resilience of Fiji together. The National Disaster Management Office today officially launched National Disaster Awareness Week 2023. The event will allow the public to understand the risks they face, know how to respond when disaster strikes, and work together to build a resilient nation. National Disaster Awareness Week is more than just an event on the calendar. It is an embodiment of our commitment to a safer and more secure future. It is time for us to come together to learn, to share and to remember that disaster preparedness is not the responsibility of one, but the duty of all. This week is about awareness, about knowledge, about unity and about action. It is about understanding the risks we face, knowing how to respond when disaster strikes, and working together to build a more resilient nation. It is a time to acknowledge the vital role that each and everyone plays in our community's safety. We must also remember that we are not alone in this endeavor. Our government, civil society, humanitarian partners, and international organizations here today also stand with us in our mission to reduce the risks posed by disasters. Collaboration both nationally and internationally is essential in creating a safer future for Fiji and the region. 
The Human Rights Measurements Initiative, or HRMI, launched its specific data on human rights for the region yesterday in Suva. HRMI is a global collaboration between researchers and on-the-ground defenders to track the human rights performance of countries around the world. Human Rights Ag Advocate Rashika Deo says that there is the need for collection of data on human rights to make better policies. Data is silent on human rights status. It becomes critical for civil society organizations, universities and academia, and data collection agencies like HRMI to collect and share data. Inclusive, comprehensive, and accurate data means better policies and resource allocation, which means transformative changes that address the inequalities and power imbalances. Data can change lives. Disability Pride Hub's Krishnia Sen says there's lack of awareness and education on human rights. Sen adds that there's a need for data and findings be available readily to the public so that the disability community is no longer looked down on or discriminated against. Very little to no knowledge about it. You know, having one's uh, dignity, integrity, and rights Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Trade Manu Akamikamida has lauded the World Investment Forum as an opportunity to gain and explore new perspectives and lessons to further the impact of just energy transition partnerships. The minister is currently in Abu Dhabi to attend this international forum. In March 2023, Fiji joined Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Tonga, the Solomon Islands in New Way in the Port Vila call for a just transition to a fossil fuel free Pacific through the island nations called for excellence accelerated action to enable the just and equitable phase out of coal, oil and gas. Kamikamida says they have also identified key Pacific tailored development pathways to support the collective move towards renewable energy. He applauds Vietnam, Indonesia and South Africa for the progressing their clean development objectives and ambitions through the development of comprehensive financing and implementation plans. In our resilient community segment tonight, Fiji's commitment to improving transparency efforts in its offshore fisheries sector balances the need for economic development and the need to conserve and protect its marine ecosystems. This was emphasized by the Minister for Fisheries, Kalaveti Ravu, at the opening of a fisheries workshop in Lamy this morning. In 2021, Fiji's fisheries sector contributed around $149.8 million to national income, requiring more efforts to ensure the long-term management of our fisheries resources at Paramuarua with this report. The Ministry of Fisheries is working with stakeholders to manage, protect and sustain our marine ecosystem, culminating in a regional workshop on improving fisheries transparency. Minister for Fisheries Kalaveti Ravu says they have a crucial responsibility to safeguard and manage marine resources for the benefit of our people. Fiji, like many nations across the Pacific, faces unique challenges in the management of offshore fisheries. Balancing the urgent needs of, for economic development with the imperative to conserve the, and protect our marine ecosystem is a formidable task. It is a challenge that requires innovation, collaboration and most importantly, transparency. The two days workshop will identify the challenges and work collectively to seek solutions. This will also help in advancing the Pacific's agenda. Improving transparency of fisheries management, improving good fisheries governance is recognized as a critical and important and effective tool to address the IUU area that is really 
creating increasing challenges here in the Pacific and across the globe. And it's something that we need to get a handle on. There is a report that was put out in 2021 by the, the Pacific Island Fisheries Forum Agency in MRAG Asia that estimated the value of tuna harvested and transshipped in the Pacific tuna fisheries involving IUU, which equated to approximately 333 billion US dollars. Fiji leads the Pacific with a sustainable and well-managed offshore fisheries sector and the participants is expected to learn and enhance their knowledge in this area. We recognize that transparency is not merely a buzzword in international agreement. It is a responsibility to our people, to our fellow nations in the Pacific, and to the global communities as we collectively work towards a common goal in com combating illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in our EEZ and in the high seas. The Improving Fisheries Transparency in Fiji workshop, convened by the Ministry of Fisheries with support from the Pacific Office of the World Wild Fund for Nature, represents a collaborative effort to create a future where oceans thrive, communities prosper, and the Pacific remains a beacon of resilience and sustainability. Eparamoa Rua, Fiji One News. Fiji One News continues with business after the break. Stay with us. Tonight's sports news is proudly sponsored by RC Manubai, the most trusted name in hardware. Bulovinaka and welcome to our sports segment. With a strong foundation and continued development, Fiji has the potential to become an even more formidable force in international rugby in the future. Fiji has produced many world-class uh, rugby players over the years, and the legacy they have created at this year's Rugby World Cup will undoubtedly inspire and lay the foundation for future generations of Fijian rugby stars. This Rugby World Cup report is brought to you by FMF. A promise of quality. R.B. Patel. We make it easy. Vodafone. Together we can. Always your play yogurt. Taste the bright side of life. Fiji Care. Leading through innovation. In association with Mobile, Tatsloto, Glamada Investments. And R.C. Manuba. The Fiji Water Flying Fijians made a lasting impression with their performance in the Rugby World Cup. Although the Flying Fijians were knocked out in the quarterfinals yesterday, coach Simon Rewalui believes the team has a bright future ahead. See hurting now in terms of uh, the result, but I couldn't be proud of this group uh, in terms of what they've, they've put in. Uh, they've built something for the next generation of Fijian rugby players that they've, they've laid a They've laid a foundation there that we can grow off. So, yeah, that, uh, yeah we're, we're hurting at the moment and it'll hurt. Rewa Louis says that the recent exit from the World Cup will stay fresh in their minds for some time. However, he's still bursting with pride for the players in the squad. The pride's never gone away. It's there from the beginning till the day I die. I'm proud of this team. This, these, these, are, these boys are family. Pride doesn't disappear. To keep improving, Rewalui believes that Fiji needs more international tests against Tier 1 nations. He would also like to see the Flying Fijians invited to join the Southern Hemisphere Rugby Championship. The, the whole idea was to make sure that our pathways were geared towards long-term success and through world rugby support, uh, DFAT, in terms of getting the, the draw into the competition, into the Super Rugby competition. Our pathways are in a good place. Uh, second thing towards that was we had to be more consistent with the way we played, uh, more consistent in uh, preparation. And I think what we've shown this year is that we've that we've grown in that in that area. And I think that's only going to grow as we go forward. 2027-31, um, we have to put ourselves in the shop window with our performance and what we've done. And if we've got that infrastructure there, if we've got success, consistent success, when the opportunity comes up, hopefully we will get a chance. But if we, con we concentrate on the long term, instead of getting the short term right, you tend to trip up on yourself. So I think we have um, very proud of the last four years before the eight years, what we've built in Fiji. And I think it's, it's there for, long-term success and sustainability so if the opportunity come, does come up I hope, hopefully we're, we've put ourselves in the, in the front of the window. 
According to Ray Walui, the future looks promising for Fijian rugby. Irfan Khan, PG1 News. The Prime Minister of Fiji, Sitiveni Rambuka, applauds the Fiji Water Flying Fijians for their performance at the Rugby World Cup and has agreed to the holding of a celebration for the team when they return to the country. The Simon Raiwalui coach side went down to England 30 points to 24 in the quarterfinals yesterday. The former Flying Fijian prop says that he could not be more proud of the boys. They uh, did as well as they could at the time under the circumstances. Uh, and, uh, you know, I couldn't have done better. Rambuka adds that the coalition government will support Rugby House in organizing a celebration. The team is expected to return to the country this week. I don't know whether they all, it'll all come back. It'll depend on what the... Obviously, uh, Rambuka will have to be organized by the Fiji Rugby Union and uh, we will, as a government, cooperate with them. The Fiji Water Flying Fijians Rugby Rankings has not changed, despite going down to England in the quarterfinals yesterday. The Simon Raiwalui coach side remains in 10th place. South Africa are back on top of the world rankings after whirlwind Rugby World Cup quarterfinal weekend, which saw both Ireland and France dumped out of the tournament. Ireland lose the top spot for the first time in over 12 months as their 17-game unbeaten streak was brought to a dramatic end by Ian Foster's avenging All Blacks. France have dropped a couple of places to fourth after their defeat to the Springboks. England's narrow win over the lower-ranked Fiji in Marseille sees them climb over Scotland into fifth. The fact that Argentina beat Wales and reaches a second semi-final in three Rugby World Cup tournaments means that the Los Pumas are now the higher ranked of the two sides. The Vodafone Fijiana side are now merely preparing for their second match of the W15-3 competition after a comfortable bonus point victory against Colombia in their opening match. A much more improved performance from their game against Japan, Captain Sirema Leoningila says they will only get better from here. Yeah, we shouldn't be, uh, uh, be complacent. Uh, Spain won't be easy. So, uh, again, one game at a time uh, and get better. Despite their encouraging appearance at the 2021 Rugby World Cup in New Zealand last year, the Fijianas have won only two of their six test matches in 2023. Inoki Male will hope his side can challenge for the title in Dubai over the next two weekends. So the cleanups were uh, by the girls at the in the ball presentation it's a bit slow. And secondly, our one-on-one uh, -on -one tackle. So we need to improve on that to okay, so we need to brush up that uh, next week before we play the uh, Spain. The Vodafone Fijianas will meet Spain on Saturday, the 21st of October at 3.15 a.m. And you can watch it live and exclusive on Fiji One. The Australian government, through Pacific Oz Sports, has announced that it will continue its support for the Fijian and Fijian and Rua teams for the next four seasons. The government has pledged to provide funding for both teams to compete in the Super Rugby Pacific and Super W competitions. Since their inclusion in their respective competitions, both the Fijiana Ndrua and the Fijian Ndrua teams have been thriving. The former claimed back-to-back -back Super W titles in 2022 and 23, while the latter made history with their first semi-final appearance in 2023. Australia's Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Pat Conroy, stated that rugby is a passion shared by both Australia and Fiji. The Australian government is proud to support the continued growth of the Fijian and Fijian and Drua teams. Builds on our partnership with Rugby Australia and in association with Fiji Rugby Union and the Fiji government that has helped the Fijiana and Drua teams to perform so well. So we look forward to the ongoing rugby partnership, developing more Fijian stars, playing for their home clubs, playing for their home country 
in the years to come. And I'm very confident that when we're back here in four years time, that not only have you had continued success in the Pacific, that you would have beaten the Poms next time around. <laughs> The recently concluded Courts Inter-District Championship is expected to generate additional income for the Fiji Football Association. The association is currently finalising the total number of fans who attended the tournament and the revenue earned from it this year. Fiji Football Association has hailed the Courts Inter-District Championship as one of the most successful tournaments. The five-day tournament which began on Fiji Day concluded last Sunday at the HFC Bank Stadium in Suva. I think it was exciting. and. Um it brought to an uh, end our football season in a grand way. Uh, we had brought in all the 20 teams, all members were here. Uh, we started on Tuesday uh, and a lot of uh, fans stand up, uh, overseas fans especially. The official numbers of fans who attended the event over the course of five days have yet to be finalised by the Fiji FA. But the parent body is hoping for strong revenue figures from the tournament. The revenue from the gate taking after cost, 50% goes to the 20 districts uh, taking part. So we haven't got the figures yet, but uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get uh, a good income so that the districts can uh, benefit from the gate shares. Bar FC emerged as the champions of the Super Premier Division, defeating Lautoka 2-1 in the final. Nandronga won the Premier Division, while Bua claimed the Senior Division title. Fiji FA also allowed national team coaches to assist the districts in the tournament, which proved to be beneficial to teams like Ba and Nandronga. They were allowed when they, they had finished and nothing to do in the afternoon. They, not only them, they, Sunil also went and assisted Nandronga uh, and mentored their coaches. So that's the part of the program. Timo also assisted a few teams when he was moving around. Mariko Rondu, we allowed him to assist. So, yeah. So our, our national coaches are uh, available. According to Chief Executive Officer Mohamed Isuf, the season was an overall success and Fiji FA is now looking forward to the 2024 season. Irfan Khan, Fiji One News. The Fiji boxing champion Winston Hill is counting down the days when he will fight New Zealand's undefeated Sawyer Dylan Archer in the 69kg PBC Oceania region title next month. This will be the first professional fight for Winston Hill. Hill has a fight record of two fights and two wins. Been uh, at it for eight weeks now and uh, the discipline is there, uh, the excitement is there. Uh, so uh, we're going into this uh, training camp, we're finishing off on a very good note. We're at a place where we want to be and we're just looking forward to fight night. We are 15 days and counting. The Super Welterweight Boxer promises fans for a good show on the 4th of November at Prince Charles Park in Nandi in the second series of the Tuai Boxing Promotion. All those that support me and don't support me, uh, come on down to uh, Prince Charles Park under the Tuai Boxing Promotions event. Uh, we're going to make sure that it doesn't finish at 2 in the morning. We're going to get your money's worth and uh, we'll make sure that the event is coordinated timely fairly and uh, the spectators, especially the spectators, enjoy the show. The qualifying races for next month's Melbourne Cup have already started. Two horses from around the world are trying to compete in this year's Melbourne Cup, dubbed the race that stops the nation. This weekend in another qualifying race, the winner is guaranteed a spot in next month's biggest horse race. The countdown is on for the Caulfield Cup, one of the year's most highly anticipated horse races. The grants betting outlets across the country prepare for the excitement as they gear up for the race that stops the nation. We're having all our staffs ready. We're preparing all the staffs to um, come in and, you know, have a peek of uh, how the Melbourne Cup is going to be. Um, uh, right now, all these qualifying races are basically a miniature Melbourne Cup. So the, we have new staffs coming in and uh, they're trying to see how it goes. So we're preparing them from this. The Caulfield Cup is one of the biggest races on the Australian racing calendar. It is seen as the ideal lead up to the Melbourne Cup. All the horses running this uh, qualifying races will be participating in the Melbourne Cup. So if you want to have a big chance to win this year's Melbourne Cup, you got to follow up from now.
Many of these horses hold the hopes and dreams of their connections, who hope to see them also qualify for the 2023 Melbourne Cup. We've got some horses from last year's uh, Melbourne Cup running into the Caulfield Cup this year. And uh, we're expecting, well, we have uh, personal favourites of Gold Trip to win the Caulfield Cup this year again. The Caulfield Cup is set to take place in Melbourne this coming Saturday and is one of the biggest events on the Australian racing calendar. Irfan Khan, PG1 News. Tonight's weather news is proudly sponsored by Courts. Quality brands, great choice. And just a quick look at the weather. Cloudy conditions with brief showers were experienced over the eastern parts of the larger islands today. Fine weather prevailed elsewhere. A trough of low pressure lies in the vicinity of Tuvalu and extends eastwards, affecting Tokelau and the northern Cooks. Another trough of low pressure lies slow moving over the northern parts of the southern Cooks. Meanwhile, an active trough of low pressure affects the Solomon Islands. And that's your latest weather and sports updates. Stay with us. Anna rejoins you with World News next. Time.